you have some of these guys that that they throw little videos on, you know, and they hit one good leg lock on a guy that has no experience with leg locks in a tournament, and they're all of a sudden a leg lock expert. You know, it's like, bro, get the fuck out of here. Fight a fight a good leg lock guy. Prove yourself. Mm. Then you could be considered a part of the like dudes that do leg locks. You know, social media. You could you don't you could yeah. be the most credited of non accredited people and get so much business. What is going on? Next weekend, March 12th, we will be covering the Matrix Jiu-Jitsu Invitational Tournament. There will be a free stream available on our YouTube page. A few days after the event, we're going to be posting HD videos of every fight also on our YouTube page. So make sure you check that out. We're bringing in five of the best fighters from the local area to compete in a round robin submission only tournament. Thanks to our sponsors, we're able to offer a 400 euro cash prize. Tune in next weekend to watch the carnage. We have some seminars coming up at Matrix Jiu Jitsu headquarters in Kaiserslautern, in Germany. On the 25th and 26th of March, we'll be hosting Leg Lock Weekend. On the 25th, Olivier Taza from the Dan and Hardest Squad and TriStar Academy will be coming to teach a seminar. And the very next day, the 26th of March, Dean Lister will be teaching a seminar. On April 8th, Ethan Krellenston, also from TriStar and the Dan and Hardest Squad, will be teaching a seminar at Matrix Jiu Jitsu. Ethan is one of the rising stars in Brazilian jiu-jitsu and I hope you guys take this opportunity to learn from him before he gets super famous and starts charging like a thousand dollars per seminar. If you're anywhere in the local area, I hope to see you there. You can find all the details on our social media. My guest today is Ruben Alvarez. Ruben is a first degree black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu under Tom de Blas. Ruben originally got his black belt from Cyborg and he recently switched over to join team Tom de We talked about that in this episode, why he made the change and how he likes training under Tom DeBloss. We covered a lot of ground in this episode. We talked about junior black belts, shooting as a martial art, training some high level jujitsu. It was great to have Ruben on the show. Please give him a warm welcome. What's up, man? Thanks a lot for coming on the show today. No problem, man. Thanks for having me. Dude, so we've obviously never met in person, but Mm -hmm. you looked older, like in your Facebook pictures and in pictures that I've seen of you. But then I was watching one of your live streams the other day and you said you're 25. Is that is that is that true? Yeah, I'm 25. That's crazy because I'm 25. (laughs) I think it's your beard. Like it's probably my beard because when I shave it, I look like I'm 15, 16. So the beard definitely makes me look older. <laughs> Dude, that that's crazy. I, I heard that. I was like, no way. I'm I'm 25. And that's and I look like I'm 12. So <laughs> hey, yo, <that> bag. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. So how did you become a black belt so young? Like I'm um, I'm a purple belt. You know, did you just start training really, really young or how how that happen? Yeah, I started uh, martial arts when I was super young. I've always been a uh, martial artist. Uh, my dad, he uh, got me into uh, Sado Karate when I was like three or four years old. And I did that for a few years, and then I didn't really like the karate too much. I wanted to do like soccer, baseball, basketball, mm-hmm. football, you know, typical cliche thing, things that kids like to do. And uh, I did that for a while, and then uh, I got overweight. And I was getting picked on, so I decided to join martial arts. So I ended up joining an uh, Aikido gym. Oh, boy. And in the Aikido gym, it was a Steven Seagal style of Aikido. It's called Tension Aikido. And Mm -hmm. I did it with uh, a third-degree black belt under Steven Seagal at the time, uh, George Angulo. I started with him. And then he started showing, like, he was a blue belt in jiu-jitsu. He started showing, like, jiu-jitsu in his Aikido classes as well for the self-defense aspect. And then... He brought his instructor in to teach two times a week at his dojo, which oh, was uh, awesome. my first my first professor, which is uh, Mike Cardozo. Hmm, that's awesome. And then from there on, I just started doing jiu-jitsu. So I started jiu-jitsu when I was like 15 years old. And yeah, I left Aikido. I left at my brown belt. I was close to getting my black. I left right at my brown belt and pursued jiu-jitsu. Mm-hmm. So 
from then on, I just trained every day and, and uh, didn't really care about the belts. I just got them young because I trained since I was 15, so yeah, almost 10 sense. years in the game now. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, do you feel like Aikido helps your jiu-jitsu at all because i've heard very mixed reviews i've heard some people say like oh no there's no nothing to do with jiu-jitsu it's you know totally unrelated and then other people say yeah it, it helps a lot so what, what do you well, think the style of aikido that we did was tension aikido which was under like i said steven seagal right so it was very you know a lot of people make jokes about steven seagal but you know he's a black belt jiu-jitsu as well uh he does a he does a lot of martial arts too that he has black belts in. He's also a, a well versed marksman, uh, very good at shooting handguns. Mm-hmm. Um, his style was to emulate real fights. So what would happen is when guys would throw punches at us, it was legit punches. I, I used to get black eyes all the time. Mm. Uh, I broke my nose a few times, and it was a lot of break falls. It was very hard on the body, and the style was rough, very very rough. But correlating into jiu-jitsu, um, there's some things that I use for my keto, like the wrist locks. You know, not yeah. not as much. But um, for self-defense aspects, there was a there's a move called jujinagi, which is a, you uh, just like no, I, I don't think it was called a jujinagi. I think it was called a. Nah, I can't remember the Japanese terms, bro. I get judo and aikido confused with I the know, Japanese man, me terms, too. but. Uh, <laughs> It was a, a throat jab. Oh, okay. And I've used that I've used that a few times at work at the nightclubs, but um that's a self defense move. It doesn't correlate for jujitsu yeah. well. That's but um jiu jitsu wise, no, nah, not really. Just the wrist locks mostly. Mm-hmm. You know, Aikido doesn't really go hand in hand with jujitsu. It's a different style. Yeah. You know, it's you know, um it's very uh using the other person's body weight against them like jujitsu, but yeah, it's it's just I mean it for me it never worked out. I've always used jujitsu for jujitsu and aikido for aikido. Right. You know they yeah. never switched together. I could I could actually correlate shooting more with jujitsu than I could aikido. Really? How so? Well, with shooting is um, I just recently got into uh, tactical shooting. I'm actually after this podcast tonight. I'm gonna go do a. Uh, level two course with uh, one of my friends who's an instructor. Oh, cool, uh, he man. runs a, a threat solution company oh, that's called cool. Inherent uh, Threat Resolutions. So he does like these tag classes, and I did the level one class with him. And man, there's just techniques that that you never think of. You have to focus on your breathing, mm-hmm. uh, your trigger, your trigger squeeze. You know, not pulling the trigger, focusing yeah. on the front sight and the back sight at the same time, and lining up towards your target. It's the same thing with jiu-jitsu. You focus on a submission, you look for it, and then you squeeze slowly. You don't put all your pressure into it because you'll blow yourself out. It's the same thing with shooting, you know? And what's funny is actually walking and shooting is just like wrestling. You got to go heel, toe, heel, toe, minus the knee. There's no knee. Hmm. But you just go heel, toe, and they're like, man, you you walk pretty good. I'm like, well, you know, wrestling helped a lot from jiu-jitsu. Yeah. So – yeah, it correlates, man, really well. Being a marksman and uh, being a jiu-jitsu fighter, you know, a lot of jiu-jitsu guys think that they can shoot because they do jiu-jitsu. It's a different type of focus, but it's still about like technique. You have to have the best technique because you see a bunch of these shooters, these professional shooters, and they're all like guys that are like two hundred pounds with beer bellies. Yeah. But yet they can shoot amazing. Why? Because right. of technique. You know. And in jiu-jitsu, too, there's some guys in jiu-jitsu that have bellies, and they're amazing. Yeah. You know? Yeah, for sure. So it's all about technique, man. Do you feel like shooting is a martial art, or do you think it's yeah. uh, different? Okay. Yeah, 100%. It's a martial art. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no bell rankings behind it because the bell rankings don't matter. Um, you got sports shooters, and then you got the guys that are combat shooters. Mm-hmm. Um I mostly train with the combat guys, uh, guys from the SWAT team, uh, my instructor, um, one of my teammates. Uh, he's also one of my instructors for shooting. He's like one of the best SWAT guys in the world right now. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, he, uh, he's very, very good. He's very proficient with the gun. His jiu-jitsu, it needs work. But, man, if I ever got into like a gunfight or something, I mm-hmm. wish I want him by my side. 
and he doesn't look like much, but this guy could hit a steel target from 100 yards with a Glock. Yeah, that's so, awesome, man. You know, that's pretty hard to do, yeah. you know, especially the focus factor on it and the breathing and trigger squeezing. It's very you know? hard to do. What's, what's funny is that he helps me with my shooting. I help him with his jiu-jitsu. And we sound like broken records because we tell each other what to do in jiu-jitsu. I tell him what to do in jiu-jitsu like what he tells me to do in shooting. It's just I can't get it in shooting. He can't get it in jiu-jitsu. I'm like, bro, you got to breathe. Think of the technique. He tells me the same thing when I'm shooting and I'm, I'm going everywhere and I'm shooting everything but the target. He's like, bro, you got to breathe. Oh, Think man. of the technique. That's cool. You know, so, so we laugh about it all the time. He's like, yeah, I'm like a black belt in shooting. You're like a white belt at shooting. And I told him, I'm like, yeah, you're a blue belt at jiu-jitsu and I'm a black belt. So man it's pretty cool i've never thought of it like that but um it's funny how jiu-jitsu correlates with so many things um just so so you said he's like one of the best swap people in the in the country how does how do they rank swap guys you know do they have Um, do they have competition usually it's not just him it's uh his team oh okay yeah um he's with the the miami uh Dade County uh, SWAT team, mm-hmm. and uh, they're known to have one of the best teams um, around. They have a, uh, I think like three full time teams and stuff like that. And all these guys do is all they do is train. That's all. They awesome. train. They train physically, yeah. mentally, and these guys shoot a lot. Like man, these guys. I just sit there and watch them train. I don't even train with them. I just watch them train, and it's like. It's like putting a bunch of black belts together and then having like a, a pro training session. Man, the way these guys work on how they they do everything is just amazing. You know, it's another form of combat that I think would help jujitsu fighters a lot. Is if they see how guys shoot mm-hmm. because it brings out a new focus factor that 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 jujitsu can't produce. You have to be totally in the moment for shooting. You know, you can't be like. Just like jujitsu to an extent. Like, you can't be, you know, thinking about the movie you just watched last night or something while you're shooting. You have to be, like, very present. And, um. Yeah. The problem, the the difference between these guys, they're training to stay alive. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Jujitsu, we just train because we like to train. Mm-hmm. You know, these guys, if they have a bad training day, that they consider that that day they could die. Mm hmm. You know, so it's like that Tim Kennedy mindset, you know, train so you could be the hardest person somebody ever has to kill, you know, and I started adopting that mindset with everything I do when I'm lifting, when I'm doing jujitsu, when I'm shooting, I'm training so I could be better than I was yesterday, but also if a situation ever arises, you know, knowing how the world is so messed up, you know, I want to be somebody that's very hard to hurt or kill, you know, so... Just so I could be able to save myself and others around me. So. Yeah, yeah. For someone like me who I know, I know, like you know, the basics of shooting and things like that. Mm-hmm. But uh, I don't. I'm no expert. So, like, what would you say is the big difference between sport shooting and combat shooting? Well, like, like I said, uh, sport, your life's not on the line. Mm-hmm. You can make mistakes and you lose the match. Big deal combat you make one little slight mistake you and your team members will die it's uh you know it's very scary you have adrenaline going in it's a different type of adrenaline when you when you compete and when you get in a real life based scenario Mm -hmm. you know uh i compete all the time but then when i go to work as a bouncer and i have to deal with like this big dude that wants to fight me it's different nerves you Mm -hmm. know different different nerves the way your mind uh triggers itself you know you could you could do all the training you want but until you get into that situation you really don't know how you're going to react you know so the difference between sports shooting and combat shooting in my opinion is life or death you Mm -hmm. know um sport you always go home hey i lost a match you know i'll get them next time combat hey i made one mistake i'm dead or i'm shot Mm -hmm. you know how does the training change specifically? Are there different techniques? Just kind of like how there's sport, more like sporty jiu-jitsu techniques versus, you know, traditional Gracie jiu-jitsu self-defense. Is it kind of like um, that in shooting too or is it more just the mindset? Well, the fundamentals are all the same for shooting. Right. Um, just like in jiu-jitsu, the fundamentals are basically the same. Mm-hmm. Um, 
uh, sports shooting is mostly just one person doing the shooting. Combat is you and a team. You know, so you have, okay. let's say I'm on a six man team. I got five other guys with me. You know, so you have to be able to be in sync with all five guys, especially if you're going to clear a building, um, do a raid, you know, something like that. You need to know where your guys are at and where you position yourself. So that way there's no friendly fire or or you leave the guy in like like a vulnerable position to get shot by the bad guy. So, yeah. you know, it's different tactics and different mindset too. You know, the SWAT guys, they're all they all have that predatorial mindset that they that they have to be aggressive but uh, like assertive at the same time mm -hmm. you know so they have to be clear-minded but they have to be aggressive so that's very hard to do you know mm -hmm. um to keep your composure while being aggressive you know so these guys have to do that sport shooting is like hey i'm gonna go out here i'm gonna hit these targets and i'm gonna look cool as hell you know look like the john wick video that everybody's posting of keanu reeves shooting yeah you know so yeah, it's it's different mindset, you know, when when you're put in a life or death situation, your mindset completely changes rather than sport. Yeah. It's the same for jiu-jitsu, you know, like I I started training uh at a Helsin Gracie affiliate. So also oh, Okay, yeah, so big self, self defense. defense. Yeah, all self defense for the most part. I mean, like a little bit of sport too for sure. Um, especially after class or at open mat, maybe try out something a little fancier, but at class self-defense, almost a hundred percent. And, uh, it was great. It was a great foundation for sure. Um, but mostly what I've realized is the two biggest differences are the mindset for sure. And then the keeping the space, you know, managing the distance. And yeah, distance like management is key. Yes. And um, those are, you know, those are the two most important things for sure. But mindset, I think, is almost, you know, is mindset is most of it. Even the mindset of like when you're going around the, the street and you're going walking around your city, keeping your situational awareness and things mm -hmm. of this nature. Yeah, 100%. Like I got to walk down this uh this alley after I get out of work, it's like 3 a.m. walking down a, a alley to get to my car, you know, with another bouncer. And we're always like looking behind us, making sure nobody's following us, looking ahead, you know, making sure that nothing happens. It's all about situational awareness, you know, and jujitsu is one of the reasons why I have that. Yeah. So how has how has uh, bouncing affected your jujitsu? How long have you been a bouncer for? Um, I started doing like little side gigs of bouncing when I was like 19. Oh, okay. And then, um, yeah, I've been doing it on and on and off for, since I was like 19. So, you know, a few years, about six years. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a job, you know, it has a mm -hmm. uh, flexible hours where, you know, I can work. I can also call off whenever I want because there's other bouncers there. Oh, that's um, cool. Yeah, so if I have a tournament, you know, I just got to get a guy to cover me, which is simple, you know. Yeah. I got a couple of friends that, that need the extra cash, and, you know, I'll go do it. That's awesome. But, um, yeah, it's it's pretty cool, you know. Um, it's not as you, – you deal with crazies, you know. But mm -hmm. uh, it's helping me in the long run for the career that I want to do, which is become a police officer. Oh, cool. So uh, one thing that I've noticed with uh, bouncing is uh, social interaction. You know, you could talk your way out of a lot of things without having to get – in an aggressive demeanor mm -hmm. where I have to, you know, enforce uh, physical contact on somebody. And, you know, it taught me how to be a better public speaker, you know, like when I walk up to people, you know, how to talk to them, you know, not be aggressive. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool, you know. What type of, uh, like, what's an example of using, you know, your words to diffuse a situation? How do you... I mean, obviously, it's dependent on the situation, you know, in general, but do you have any techniques that you use? I don't really have techniques. I just go, like, off the rip, like how you do with the podcast, you know. Yeah. I don't have a, a set pair of questions that I just walk up and ask the guy, you know. Right. Um, one thing is I have a mental coach named Eric Parker. He owns uh, Wintensity, which is a, it's, um, a company that he has where uh, – you know, it helps fighters keep their composure when they're stressed so they, they don't let their nerves uh, 
get the best of him. And he talks about the cortex. And the cerebral cortex is, uh, you know, like I said, what, what the SWAT guys do is being aggressive, but yet being aware of everything, you know, and being clear-minded. So, like, usually I walk up and I talk to them and how I'm talking to you, very nice. You know, I'm like, hey, man, uh, you mind if we could talk outside real quick? I just got to gotta tell you something. And I go off of there. Like, if the guy starts screaming at me, I'll even lower my voice a little bit more. I'll whisper. Mm-hmm. I'll be like, hey, man, you don't have to talk like that. You know, just talk to me normal, yeah. you know. And usually they calm down. There's sometimes, bro, that guys are just so gone and they're so drunk they. You know, you got to take them out. Not much you can do. Yeah, there's not much. You know, that you can lead the horse to water, but you can't force it to drink. Yeah. So, you know, I usually do the three strike rule. I give them like three chances and then, yeah, take them out. Mm-hmm. How often, I've always wondered this, how often do you have to kick someone out? Is it every single day for the most part? Or do you have some days where it's fine and no one's causing any problems at all? Usually, at least, I kick one person out every weekend. Okay. Uh, it doesn't It doesn't have to be violent. Uh, like, yesterday, we kicked out a guy that was overly intoxicated, and then he became violent belligerent when, when we actually walked him out. When, we, when he left the property, he turned right around and just switched like that. And, you know, thank God at, at one of my jobs, we have an off-duty cop, so... The cops just handled that for us, you know. Oh, cool. So, yeah, it's not that bad. It's not that bad, yeah. Do you uh, do you ever get into any like significant altercations? Like, do you have do you have times where you really need to use your jujitsu, or is it mostly pretty pretty relaxed? There's a couple of times I had to use my jujitsu, um, and jujitsu saved my ass, you know. Thank yeah. God. <laughs> um, somewhere against bigger guys. Yeah. Some more against more aggressive guys. Um, I even fought a jiu-jitsu guy one time at the nightclub. Oh, really? How'd that yeah. go? Um, well, it was a guy from Brazil. And he was with a bunch of his jiu-jitsu buddies at the nightclub. And I guess this guy's not accustomed to our customs of that you just don't walk up to a girl and grab her by her snatch. Yeah. And, and try to drag her, like do the donald trump and try to drag her to dance probably not the best idea you know you gotta you gotta spit some game first before you even make an attempt yeah um, (laughs) so this girl comes crying to me and she's like bro this guy grabbed me and you know he grabbed me by my my private areas and and like i'm i'm scared and i'm like okay well i walk up to the guy i'm like hey man let's go outside let's talk real quick you know um Let's just talk. And the guy's like, get the fuck away from me. And like his broken Brazilian. Oh, wow. Uh, but he didn't have cauliflower or nothing. He didn't look like a jujitsu guy. So yeah. I was like, all right, man, let's go. So I grab, I, I'm like, put your beard down and let's walk outside. The guy tells me to go fuck myself again. So this time I did two strikes. I'm like, dude, this is the last time I'm going to tell you. Let's go outside and let's talk. You know, you're not, you're not in trouble yet. Let's just go outside and let's have a conversation. Mm-hmm. The guy tells me to go fuck myself. Okay, I'm going to go fuck myself, but I'm going to kick you out first. So I grab him by where his hand, uh, he's holding the beer. Mm-hmm. I grab him by his arm. Usually I go two-on-ones on people. So I go two-on-one on his arm and the guy starts resisting. So I break the beer bottle out of his hand and I start walking him down. All of a sudden, when we get to the front door, the guy turns around and tries to sucker punch me. Mm. So when he does that, I throw his arm in the air and I just spear him right out the front door. Boom. I spear him right out the front door. Next thing you know, this guy's putting me in guard and tries wrapping me up. I'm like, oh shit, this guy knows jujitsu. So I posture up. Well, actually, there's a funny story behind it. When I speared him out the door, after he tried to swing on me, I looked up at my boss to get my two points. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. Because we were practicing a lot of wrestling that week. And we're, we're, it was based off of who won on points. Oh, so that's we too funny. Just look at, at our instructor to get the points. And I guess, you know, like the way you train is the way you're going to fight. So I took him down. I looked up at my manager for the two points. I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> so then I posture. You know, I keep the guy that's in place. Funny. The other bouncers come. You know, the guy puts up a fight. And then um, the guy leaves. 
and starts talking shit. His shirt's all ripped up, you know. We try to get a report from the girl, but the girl left. And um, then the guy called the cops on me. And the cops were like, dude, like, this not guy a, is crazy. Not He's a good drunk. Idea. <laughs> so, like, he almost he almost got arrested by the cops because he wanted to fight one of the cops. You know, and we're like, oh, my God. Not a good idea, dude. Not so a good then, vacation to America. Yeah, so then I don't even know. I thought this guy probably did like, you know, like one or two jiu-jitsu classes, you know. So I go back inside and next thing you know, my manager calls me and goes, bro, there's like four or five guys outside and they're looking for you. (laughs) Like, oh God. So I go outside and I go with like two of my other bouncers who are black belts in jiu-jitsu as well. Oh, wow. And I I go out to the front to see what's going on. And this guy, this buff dude with cauliflower ears walks towards me. So I'm like, okay. (laughs) let's go and he's like no man i don't want to fight you i was like yeah i don't want to fight you either you got the same ears as me <laughs> and he's like yeah man uh i do jujitsu i'm a black belt you know i came here with my students yeah uh, my student says you kicked them out and you beat them up i'm like well first of all i don't know if you know but your student walked up and grabbed a girl in her private area and that's uncalled for man you know i don't care what culture yeah. you're from you know if you're gonna be here in the u.s you can't do that stuff man he's lucky he didn't get arrested yeah and I'm like, and he was being belligerent with the cops. And the instructor understood completely, and he was appalled, you know. And we got along great, and I met the jiu-jitsu guys, uh, his other teammates. They were super nice guys. They're like, man, you know, he, he always tries to get it. When he has too much to drink, he always acts crazy. So I was like, yeah, you guys got to keep him in check. So that was a weird story. I found out the guy was like a blue belt, ready to get his purple belt. I was like, man, I don't, this is bad. I don't know about that, man. Fuck. Can't be doing can't be doing that in the clubs bro no no you really can't uh alcohol is a hell of a drug though like Mm -hmm. it really can change people and change their behavior completely yep so maybe he's a cool dude in the gym or something when he's sober but fuck that's hey he could be the nicest guy in the world but after two or three drinks he could be the worst guy in the world yeah you know that's why i don't drink you know yeah, it, no thanks. There's no, there's nothing positive that comes from drinking if you really look at it. No. You know, you drink too little, you get a buzz. You drink too much, you're throwing up, and then you're yeah. belligerent. You're either getting your ass choked out or you're in the back of a cop car. Yeah. Or you're dead. And even if you just drink a little bit, there's so many negative health benefits that go along with it that, for me, yeah. the inflammation is killer. Like, I have a, I have a bad elbow just from fucking not tapping at Camoros when I was a white belt and stuff yeah. like that. And uh, whenever I drink anything, it flares up and I have to, you know, deal with that. So, and you sleep, yeah. you sleep like shit and you sleep terribly. So, no thanks. I'll have a beer every once in a while, but especially living yeah, here. Yeah, that's fine. Like a social yeah. drink's awesome, you know. But, yeah. you know, I'm not the type to go out there and get plastic. I don't even drink at all. To be honest, I never liked the taste of beer. I never liked the taste of alcohol. I think I've only been drunk like once or twice in my life that I could count. That's awesome. You know, um, props to you. Never really, never really went out and partied and drank. You know, you're not missing too much. Never my thing. And um, I like the honestly the only reason I drink beer is because I'm here in Germany, and their beer their beer is fucking incredible. So yeah, I'm sure you know different story. (laughs) Like back in the states, known for the beer. Yeah, back in the states, I never drank beer, and then I came over here. And I had a few months where I was, I was drinking pretty regularly, and now I've kind of stopped because it's been I've been here for a while. But yeah, um, yeah man, I whenever I'm drinking, like I just don't feel good, and um, you know, there's so many other things you can do to make yourself feel good. And um, yeah, like it's just, just act like an idiot. People act crazy. It's it's, yeah, uh, it's no good. It's, I'm sure you nuts. see it every fucking day. Yeah, thank God for jujitsu. It led me on a on a healthy lifestyle. Yeah, minus the way that I eat. I eat so much like junk food because I love food. But like drinking, doing drugs, never did it. You yeah. know, because I was always preparing for a competition. So yeah, your priorities change for sure. Um, so another topic I wanted to talk to you about is you uh, just got your first degree under Tom DeBloss, right? Mm-hmm. Congrats, yep. man! That's awesome. Thank you, bro. How long have you been a part of his team? Um, with Tom, it's not even a year yet I've been with him. I've been with him for a few months. But, um, man, I'm really happy being under Tom. 
you know, uh, <clears throat> he's a very genuine guy. What you see on Facebook is yeah. actually him. You know, he's not one of those people that, you know, a lot of things I see in jiu-jitsu is a lot of fakeness lately. Really? You know, I see a lot of people that preach philosophy but don't live by it. Um, Tom lives by his philosophy. And yeah. that's something I can respect. And the thing about Tom is that he's very loyal to me and I'm very loyal to him. You know, and uh, man, he'll just randomly text me just to check how I'm doing. He'll always share things that if I need it shared, you know, he's he's very selfless. You know, he helps his guys more than he helps himself. So, and that's why I think he's having such a big success in the community of jiu-jitsu yeah. is because, you know, he's proving that, you know, you could be tough, but you could also be genuine. Yeah. You know, and that... You know, if you look out for others, others will look out for you. And he's starting a movement, which is amazing, you know. You know, there's a there's a bunch of other jiu-jitsu black belt guys that are amazing as well. But, you know, I clicked with Tom, you know. It's it's hard being an American in a Brazilian sport, you know. Hmm. So, yeah, I can't complain about Tom. I love him. Uh, we have a great team. We got a lot yeah. of beasts on the team. He's yeah, always sure getting do. new guys uh, affiliating <laughs> with themselves down here. So yeah, man. it's awesome. You got a really great team. You just had like Josh Hayden is on the team. He's Josh Hayden is one of the newest uh, additions, isn't he? Yeah, Josh and his brother Jason. Yeah, they're Hayden, they're who's a beast monsters. As well. Yeah, I have their I have his uh, DVD. It's awesome. Oh, the eighty twenty. Yeah, yeah. It's fuck. It's I good. have it too, man. It's amazing. He's, um, he's awesome. Josh, Josh had kind of like the same thing as me, where. We were actually talking together when we were going to make the switch. The problem is, is Josh made a switch, but he couldn't officially tell people that he made the switch till after EBI, after he faced Gordon. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. But yeah, me and Josh, uh, we're homies, and uh, we are talking, and we are having, we are trying to figure out where we were going to go next. I told him, like, dude, man, I'm going to, I'm going to Tom, dude. Tom's had my back before I was even a part of his team. Mm-hmm. And imagine when I get on his team, how, how much he's going to have my back even more. Yeah. And Josh was like, yeah, man, you know, I click with what Tom says about everything. And, uh, yeah, I think I'm going to switch too. And then one day I called Josh. I was like, look, man, I switched to Tom's. And he's like, bro, I just messaged Tom too. You know, I switched to him too. And his uh, his brother and uh, another, another one of my teammates, uh, Travis, who owns uh, the Gracie Fishhawk Gym with uh, – uh, Josh. Oh yeah. Travis and Jason came to Tom's seminar and they talked to him and they vibe with him and they're like, "Yeah, we're we're gonna be a part of this affiliation with you." So, you know, it was it was pretty cool to to have a couple of my homies join the join the affiliation. Another guy too that's on the affiliation is Freddie Trillo, who I train with a lot. Yeah, Freddie's gonna uh, be on the podcast in a, in a few weeks. Yeah, Freddie. Uh, when I told Freddie I was going to Tom's. You know, Freddie was in a, a world one too about where he wanted to be affiliated with, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, he was like, you know what, man, you're my boy. I'm going to go with you. And, you know, Freddie's been nothing but happy about being under Tom, you know. That's awesome. So it's pretty cool, you know. And then another thing, too, is that what's funny is the seminar that Tom had in Miami, he got, huh, he got three guys out of it. Well, actually four guys. He got me, Freddie, Travis. Uh, Jason. Oh, and the fifth guy was uh, was uh, Ray Crenshaw from Kentucky. He oh. he came all the way down to meet Tom, and he affiliated with Tom when he saw that both me, Freddie, and uh, and Travis and Jason, we we all just like went to Tom's team. He's like, yeah, man, you know, I I like Tom a lot, and mm-hmm. I'm gonna be on his team too. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty cool, man. You know, it's 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 growing. His affiliation is growing, and it's gonna be. I think it's going to be a new powerhouse in jiu-jitsu. You know, you just got to give yeah. it some time. I think so, But too. the thing is, the thing that's unique about Tom is that, you know, he's always busy, but he'll always make time for the affiliation guys. You know, he always messages us. He always gives us words of encouragement. You know, he always asks when when the next one of us is going to compete. You know, so he's a true leader, you know. Yeah, that's, I think, one of the most important things about being a leader is checking in on people, knowing uh, – you know, knowing when their next tournament is, knowing when they're knowing like what's going on in their life. You know, you can't just be, um, you can't be oblivious to all that stuff. You know, you have to, yeah, you have to really know. Yeah, the big problem I see with affiliations is that they just want your money, but they don't care about, they don't care about you. 
you know? Yeah. yeah. And Tom's not about that, you know? And and that's why I like about him is that he never let money corrupt him, you know? Mm. So, yeah, I, I can't express how happy I am to be part of uh, Team The Blast and and the Ricardo Almeida and Henzo Gracie team, you know, so. Yeah, it's an awesome lineage. Fucking yeah. awesome team. Um, what do you, what would you say are like the uh, characteristics of Tom's team, if that makes sense? Or like the, um, the, the values, if you, if you will. The values are, is, uh, you know, we got to be honest. First of all, we have to speak our minds. You know, we don't hold back, you know, um, mm-hmm. we speak our mind. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, we're all nice guys, but we'll all slap you at the same time, you know. So, you know, it's a, it's a great team, dude. You know, we're, we're all cool dudes, you know, but we're a team that you shouldn't mess with mm-hmm. you know, as well. You know, we're, we're the guys that everybody loves and that nobody wants to fuck with either. So, yeah, it, it's it's awesome to be a part of the team. You know, we all help each other grow as well. You know, we're always sharing ideas on our group chat. You know, we're always posting funny videos on the group chat. So, like, if one guy's having a bad day, we'll post, like, a funny video and we'll all laugh. Oh, that's cool. Uh, we rank on each other like we're brothers, you know. Uh, Ray, Ray's one of the only black guys on the team, so we call him the token black guy. You know, we're always making fun of him. Uh, Todd Schaefer, or Schaffer, I don't, I don't really know how to say his last name too well. <laughs> but we're always making fun of Todd, especially Tom. Tom gets on Todd. Um Especially his uh, his addiction to shrimp scampi. So we'll go at him on the chat. We'll go after Jason with his nice man bun. We'll go after Josh with his big ass legs. They'll come after me. You know, it, it's awesome. You know, I can't complain. That sounds like a cool community to be a part of for sure. Some like good yeah. people to have you back. Um, it's funny that we're talking about this because I was actually talking to some people about teams yesterday i was thinking it's jiu-jitsu is so unique because if you have you have other sports where you know like for example the baltimore orioles or the yankees they're owned Uh they're owned by someone it's like a Uh corporation almost you know like yeah there's a team yeah there's you know legit athletes involved but like it's a it's a business it's a Uh not not even just a business it's like a fucking massive industry you know yeah and i was thinking it's so cool jujitsu is literally just just people you know someone like tom who's just a bad motherfucker who trained with a whole bunch of bad motherfuckers and he's like you know what i have a team now and then he gets a bunch of people together and they're like yeah we're we're team to blast and yeah and it's it's cool you know it's uh it's a lot more personal if that makes sense it's like uh it's like an episode of Gangland, you know. Yeah. They talk about how the gang, the gangs get originated and stuff. You know, it's the same thing with jujitsu. Yeah. You know? We're just a, a group of dudes that decide we have the same mindset and ideologies, and we're gonna stick with it. You know, we'll help each other grow. Yeah. Yeah, man, it's awesome. And um, for me, like one of the things that attracted me to jujitsu over other martial arts was the mentality of like you find a mentor or someone who you apprentice under. You know, like, I feel like it's it's one of the last things where you have, you are, it's up to you to seek out some teacher, you know? Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, you can go to university and pay a ton of money, and then you can have a teacher that way, but it's like you're you're buying your, your teacher. With jujitsu, it's like you have to, you have to earn your teacher in a way. Yeah. And I, I think that's so cool. And you have to go through a, a set of teachers to finally find the one that you want. You know, some people... Off of the first bat, they'll find a, a professor that they'll stick with from white to black, mm-hmm. you know. And then you got guys like me that, you know, I've I've started with Mike Cardozo, then went to, uh, uh, well, I, I have a long history in jiu-jitsu, you know, because when yeah. I started jiu-jitsu, there was only like two or three academies in Miami. Yeah. You know, and it wasn't that popular. But, um, like, I had Mike, I had George Masvidal as my instructor for a little bit. He was showing me MMA when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. You know, and then I went under the Valente brothers for like a few months because both of my instructors left. So, you know, they were they were the only ones that were close by. Okay. And I went back to Mike because Mike finally opened his gym. I stuck with Mike till Purple Belt. Then around Purple Belt, like we had a separation of the teams. 
So I stuck it out with Mike, but there was just a bunch of white belts, and I was competing full time. Yeah, so I hard. Meet, I ended up meeting Cyborg, and then stayed with Cyborg from purple all the way to black. Oh, really? And then, yeah, I had my I little falling out with um, that team. I'm still cool with them, but I had a little falling out, and then I switched to Tom's, and now I'm I'm gonna stay with Tom for life. You know, yeah. uh, you know, I learned a lot being under Cyborg. You know, he, he taught me a lot, and I'm very grateful for him. And, you know, I still uh, text him now and then, you know, and he's doing big things with his association, but yeah, it, I just felt better. I felt like a better fit for Tom. Yeah, man. Um, what was it like training under Cyborg? <sighs> it, was, it was amazing, you know. Yeah. Um, I've been with Cyborg when I was like 17, 17 or 18. Wow. I started with and uh that's young I, yeah i knew him when he had a small gym on top of a jewish deli and it was just me him and like four other guys on the team that's you awesome know? he probably only had 20 25 guys the most in that gym wow and you know fridays sometimes it would just be me and cyborg on fridays rolling for two hours and it was awesome. And now he's a huge household name in jiu-jitsu. He's got multiple associations. He's got a beautiful academy. He's got multiple black belts. Yeah. You know, and he's grown tremendously. I was there when he got his first call for ADCC. I remember we were all in our Ds, and he got the call to ADCC, and he's like, bro, put on your nogi stuff. Let's start rolling nogi. I was like, all right, cool. Let's get ready for ADCC. That's so cool. And, uh... Yeah, that's one that he got all the way to the finals with Verdum, you know, and we were all staying up at five in the morning watching the the matches at the gym. That's awesome, man. And it it's pretty cool to see his evolution. You know, he deserves everything. Um, but yeah, it was, it was awesome to come up. I got to meet like guys like Bushesha, Takino, uh, Brali Ostima. Yeah. Uh, just so many jujitsu guys that I looked up to, mm. and they're there training with me. You know, so it, it was pretty cool being in that room full of monsters. That's awesome, dude. That's so cool. Yeah. What a uh, kind of getting getting into the the weeds a little bit, but like, what type of what type of stuff does t- Cyborg teach on a daily basis? What is what do his classes? What do they look like? Um. Well, his competition classes were no joke. You know, you do a heavy cardiovascular warm up. You know, where you, you want to die, and you do a lot of drilling. Like Cyborg was very big mm-hmm. on doing movement drills. You know, we would do a shitload of movement drills, and then we would drill our technique of the day, and we would drill it a lot, and then we would do situational sparring, and then we would do regular sparring. And, man, it was like a two-hour and 30-minute comp class, you know, every day, every morning. That's that's a long practice. And it was a long practice, and, man, you know, you'd come out losing like eight pounds in that practice, you know, just of water. So it was amazing. You know, it was amazing to have that inside of jiu-jitsu. You know, um, yeah, it was it was awesome. Like his his classes were awesome. He's a very enthusiastic teacher. You know, um, it's funny when he does his little Brazilian. Like when he talks his accent, he does a lot of oh oh, like showing the technique, and you're like oh okay, you know. So it, it was awesome. <coughs> Dude, that sounds that sounds pretty intense. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's... he's an intense guy, but he's he's a nice guy. That's that's great. That's really good to hear. I'm glad that you guys are still on good terms. And, um, yeah. yeah, dude, I was in Poland for five months. I talk about it on this podcast every pretty often. So if you're listening to this podcast, and you're like, fuck, he's going to say Poland shit again. Like, fuck. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, their, their training was very intense in Poland, but it's, it sounds a lot like what you just described, but it was only an hour and a half and I was done yeah. after an hour and a half. I was done every single day. Like we would be standing in line, you know, to do the the final bow out, and it, like sometimes I couldn't, I couldn't stand. Like I could barely hold myself up, and uh, yeah. I can't imagine two and a half hours. That that's that's incredible. That's yeah, it would vary. It'd be like sometimes it'd be an hour and thirty minutes, okay. or it'd be like two hours, and then sometimes two hours and thirty minutes. I just remember the two hour and thirty minute ones because I remember when we would line up. I was trying to hold myself from not fainting, you know. Yes, exactly, dude. So, but I you was, remember the most uh, traumatic, traumatic sessions. 
Yes, you sure do. I have them all like like I can clearly distinguish in my mind like my top five hardest trainings. And uh, I'm, I'm sure you're probably the same. That's, man, that's crazy. Two and a half hours. Um, that's such a cool experience. How does training under Cyborg, like what is his teaching style compared to Tom? Uh, it's different ideologies, you know. Um, mm-hmm. Cyborg's uh, very, you know, Cyborg's aggressive, but he's very, like, like he, he's, I don't know, bro, it's, like, hard to say, man. Like, he's, like, smooth with the yeah. way that he does stuff. With Tom, Tom's very smooth, but Tom's got more aggression mm-hmm. when he rolls. You know, like, uh, man, rolling with Tom's like rolling with Harambe on steroids <laughs> just coming after you. For a banana, you know, I, <laughs> I'd never been snapped down so many times in my life since I rolled with Tom. But you know, Tom's got Tom's mindset is uh is like how you know, like you know, you're training to be the hardest person somebody ever has to kill. Yeah, you know, that's how Tom trains his sessions, man, and they're intense. But I love it. You know, it makes you makes you either grow a pair of nuts. Or it makes you turn into like a little bitch, you know. Yeah. You got nut up or shut up in Tom's training sessions, you know. He posts. So. Yeah. He posts a lot on Facebook about uh, being intense in a, a lot of situations, you know, like mm-hmm. don't just relax in side control. Don't just relax, you know, no. when you're trying to pass about, the guard. Yeah, the thing about like Tom is like he'll if he sees you like stalling out on your roll, he'll call you out on it. Really? You know? That's cool. Yeah, he'll call you out. He'll be like, bro, you know, fucking keep moving and try to submit your guy, bro. Yeah. You know, everything's about the submission, not not just sitting there and pussyfooting around, you know, and I like that because I'm, I'm very sub-oriented. Like me, I go for kills, you know. I'm all about the gusto. Mm-hmm. And Tom's the same way, man, you know, because you get, you know, you can win matches and stuff, but once you sub somebody, bro, they can't, they have no room to talk shit. Yeah. 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 So he's very sub oriented, you know. And he's very aggressive, dude. I remember the next day I woke up from a training session with him, bro, I couldn't move my neck. I was looking like Robocop. You know, and my best friend too. My best friend went with me to Jersey to train too and he's like, Bro, I can't move my fucking neck. <laughs> like, oh that fucking gorilla. <laughs> I'm such a gorilla. This is a big dude. <laughs> he's a big dude, man. <laughs> I would hate to see him on a bad day. Just looks like a very large human being. <laughs> Dude, his hands are huge. You know? <laughs> like he grabbed like my whole head, like I was, like like it was like a little like dodgeball. <laughs> that's that's no fun. <laughs> that's no fun at all. No. Um, dude, another thing I wanted to talk to you about before we wrap this up is uh, you did a live stream the other day about junior black belts, yeah. and uh, I watched it. But I know a lot of people listening to this probably didn't. And it's funny, I don't, you probably don't know this, but one of my, one of my great friends, Mike Stewart, is the guy who called, did the calling out that prompted the whole thing, you know, the whole, all the Facebook articles and everything all started with my friend, Mike Stewart, just (laughs) posting a picture of some junior black belts and saying like, what the fuck's this shit? Look what happened with me. I posted one video just to let everybody know that there was a fake black belt in the area and that I had to call him out, you know, after being nice to him a few times. And, man, the video went viral. Yeah. And, you know, it's not a way I wanted to have my name recognized, you know, but the problem is is that do we want Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu to end up becoming like sport karate? You know, um, sport karate has no respect in the martial art community, you know, um, yeah. You have kids that are four or five years old walking around with black belts. You know how many how many times like in high school did everybody have that one kid that had a black belt in karate and he always got his ass kicked? Yeah, you know it's a false sense of security. Jiu-jitsu is known for being a pinnacle martial art of having real martial artists that you know it took time to get that belt. Yeah, and people don't look at it like that. You know they just see it as oh you know. Just if 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 his feelings get hurt, give him a black belt. Mm-hmm. No, bro, that's not how it works. In life, nothing's handed to you. You have to go out and get it. You know, 
you know that's why you see guys with cauliflower ears broken noses you know they they get after it you know they get after in their training sessions you know just wrapping a black belt around my waist doesn't mean it's a piece of cloth that just holds up my gi you know it's it shows the time that it took for me to get there you know i left a scholarship for for college for music to do it you know i got out of relationships with girls that you know that i thought that i could probably potentially fall in love with because you know they didn't see eye to eye on my passion for jiu-jitsu you know it was either her or jiu-jitsu i picked jiu-jitsu you know injuries um dealing with stresses of of do i still want to compete you know um everybody has those up and up and downs in jiu-jitsu where it's like do i still want to keep doing this do i want to you know jiu-jitsu test your mind body and soul and and you reap the benefits from it, which is getting your well-deserved belt, you know? Yeah. Um, and, you know, just to hand somebody a belt without going through the trials and tribulations, uh, you know, what, you know, what, what does that mean? Yeah. So I agree. We're watering down, we're watering down jujitsu, you know, like everybody's posting that thing that says make jujitsu violent again. You know, um, back in the days we, I was talking with my, because I trained at a, at a place across the street from my house, WMB was one of my first instructors. Uh, he uh, he was talking about, like, one time when a fake belt came in that they locked the door and, you know, he had to fight everybody, you know, like open hand strikes, you know, like EBI combat rules. And those were the days where it's like, yo, man, you don't fuck with jiu-jitsu guys. You don't come in faking. And now they're giving kids junior black belts, you know. Yeah. It makes no sense, bro. How are you going to respect a martial art when the kid doesn't even have life experience and he has a black belt and he's a higher belt than you? Yeah. In this particular case, I thought it was, uh, I thought it was interesting because apparently the guy who gave out these black belts, he like he did not intend to give a jujitsu black belt. It was a different martial art. It was like some kung fu fucking okay, street that's kung cool. fu yeah and um the that's thing that's cool but yeah go ahead i'll start for interrupting no, but that's ahead. cool but don't wear a jiu-jitsu uniform while you do it that's what i'm saying that's what i'm saying like and also and his whole thing was he was like oh i ordered the not even that i ordered the wrong belt but he was like we ordered black belts from a company they sent us jujitsu black belts and we didn't have enough time to get the replacement i was like that means you reschedule the promotion ceremony. I'm sorry. Like just get a knife and cut off the sleeve. Yeah, or do do some, whatever. Yeah. You know, don't don't put don't post a picture on Facebook. You know, like whatever you got to do. Like you know, if you have imagine you're going to give someone, you know, an award. Like let's say hypothetically for the police. You know, like you join the police, you get recognized for an award, um, you know, some some sort of medal. And then on your ceremony, they're like, oh, man, you know what? Um, a- they accidentally sent us the uh, Medal of Honor, well, you know, like the equivalent of the Medal of Honor for the police. I'm they're not like, accept that. Yeah, no. exactly. They're like, <laughs> it's like, but we're just going to give this to you just because, you know, the company fucked up. They sent us the wrong medal. You know, it's like, no, you, you would reschedule the promotion ceremony or whatever, you know. Like, <laughs> the problem is now is society itself mm-hmm. is that. You know, I was reading a book called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck by Mark Manson. Mark Mason. <laughs> this is the second you know, time the, this weekend I've heard about that book. <laughs> yo, you know, like, I saw the book. I saw a dude reading it in the airport, and I was like, wow, that's fucking gay. You know? And, and I was like, then I then I looked it up on Google, and I saw it had great reviews. I'm like, you know what, man? I'm just going to read this book. Fuck yeah. it. You know? And I didn't give a fuck anymore, and I read the book. And, <laughs> you know, it talks about, it talks about how society is where... You know, everybody, like, everybody's told that they could accomplish anything that they want, you know, and and it's true, you can, but you're going to fail a lot, you know, and they don't talk about the failing process, you know, of that you have to work to get to what you want, you know, and it's not always going to happen in the first try. And, and in the book, you know, he talks about society that everybody's told that they could be what they want to be. Not everybody could be what they want to be, you know. You're going to fail a bunch of times and you're probably never going to get there. You have to live with the fact that you're never going to get there. Mm -hmm. But you got to make the best of it. And the problem is, is that everybody thinks that they're entitled to something now. You know, like I'm entitled to get this black belt. No, you ain't entitled to shit, bro. You work to get it. 
you know, and kids, kids nowadays are, are being more disrespectful because, you know, they get things their way, you know, and like you see these kids with the junior black belts, man, it, it, that's not how it works. You know, you got to be an adult, you know, there's, there's set of criteria that you have to abide by in jujitsu to get to your belts. You know, the highest belt that a kid 16 and under could get is uh, probably a blue belt. Mm-hmm. Or a green belt, you know. If he's fifteen, there ain't, there's no fifteen year old blue belts yeah. that I've seen. You know, it's always sixteen, seventeen year old blue belts. Yeah, you know. And then they have to wait till they're they're close to eighteen or nineteen to get their their purple. You mm-hmm. know. And how are you gonna give a little ten year old uh, a junior black belt and say that he's there? You know, there's there's levels to it. You know? Yeah, and I don't think it should be acceptable in any martial art. You know, like this guy was saying, and and again, I've never met this guy. We would, I mean, I'm sure he's fine. You know, he's teaching martial arts. Like, I probably would not be my enemy, is what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. But his thing was like, oh, this is not a jujitsu style. We are giving them a black belt in this other style that we teach at our academy. And to that, I say, like, if you're giving a black belt in any martial art to a kid, like, I have a problem with that. I don't care if it's another style, I don't care if it's taekwondo or karate. Or judo. Yeah, as long as like, it's not jujitsu. Yeah, but the, you know what I mean. Like I, 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 even think you shouldn't give a black belt to a kid, no matter what, no matter what style it is. You know, like if you are, then something's wrong with your style. No, I agree, but that's not my style. My style that I that I dedicated my life to is jujitsu. Yeah. So I'll I'll defend jujitsu as much as I can, even when most of the jujitsu like. Most of the jiu-jitsu community had my back when I called out the fake, but then there were some guys that were like, oh, you should have taken him to the office and pet his head and taken him to a safe zone and and tell him that everything's going to be all right. Yeah, you know, it's like the club. I gave the guy chances. I told him nicely, and then I had to fucking go balls out, and that's when the guy admitted, you know, and I'm cool with the guy now. I talk to the guy a lot. You know, he understood. It's a life lesson that he that he learned from that he's like you know what man you, you open my eyes i'm never gonna do that again you know i have to own up this stuff and it's just like with this instructor here you know this guy's making a shitload of excuses but yet he promotes the kids with jiu-jitsu black belts jiu-jitsu geese while wearing a hinato tavares patch because i know hinato yeah doesn't he's play a that. badass motherfucker Hinato's a badass, bro, and one of the nicest guys I've met in the sport, and he's very legit, and he's old school Carlson Gracie. Those old school guys don't play that. No. So, you know, you're doing that, and you know damn well that there's a criteria, you know. If if he wanted to give a a black belt in his little kung fu hanky-panky martial art, Mm -hmm. he should have did it in their cheap geese, their cheap karate kung fu geese, whatever they Mm -hmm. were. While wearing their little assistant instructor, junior instructor patches that you know that they give to the kung fu kids, right? And they give them a black belt that didn't have a bar on it, you know. I have no problem with that. That's your martial art. I don't know anything about kung fu and karate and stuff like that, you know. But then when you start doing it uh, with the jujitsu geese and belts, no, nah, homie, you know, and yeah. and it's not right, you know. You can make it any excuse that you want, but if you're a jujitsu guy, you should know this, man. You know, yeah, you should. You should know this, especially with the way social media is with jujitsu. You you should know this, man. Like, you know, you're gonna get called out on some bullshit. You know, there's there's still legit guys that call people on. They're not they're not afraid to get the reprimandations behind it. Yeah, you know, Uh, like me, I wasn't. People were like, "Oh, take down the fake black belt video." Why? I know I was right for what I did. Yeah, I didn't touch the guy. I didn't hurt the guy. I invited the guy back. Can you you tell the story? Can you tell the story for people who might not have heard what happened? Um, I'll make a short synopsis. Yeah, so, short synopsis. But um, guy walks into the gym, tells me he's a black belt or George Macaco, Patino, who's a legend in jiu-jitsu. And he speaks Portuguese with the owner, comes, does a couple classes while wearing a black belt, wrestling shoes and a gi. You know, gives mm-hmm. me a fake story about how he got hurt fighting the old school Valetudos, repping the flag of jiu-jitsu. You know, does a bunch of the... The classes, I I do my research, find out he's not a legit black belt, you know. I call him out on it a few times, you know, very nicely. And then one of the students was recording it, and, you know, uh, one day I just had enough of telling him, hey, bro, you're not a black belt, and he wanted to argue, and, you know, I snapped on him. I didn't really snap, I just got aggressive with him, you know, got in his face, told him, hey, you're a fake, you know, like, don't fucking lie to me in my gym, you know, don't play me for a fool. And he admitted to it, and... You know, he left and, 
we became friends after that and now he's trying to live a better life by owning up to his mistakes you know the thing that i see is like this instructor they make so many excuses but nobody owns up to their their excuses you know it's easier to just say you know what man i fucked up i was wrong and move on about it you know yep. the problem is nobody wants to admit when they're wrong you know i i admitted to, to i did an interview right after the thing i was like you know what i admit i was wrong the reason I recorded it was so that this guy doesn't hurt anybody in his academy and he doesn't get hurt as well because he's lucky I just gave him a few F-bombs and told him to come back whenever he want, whenever he feels ready that he's ready to come back as a white belt. Then getting an old school crazy guy that's going to lock the door and beat the shit out of him. Yep. You know? Plenty of those and guys. There's a plenty. If you ask any old school guy, yeah. bro, they'll lock the door and beat the shit out of you. Yeah. You know? And and those guys. that's not what i want you know yeah and uh the guy learned from his mistakes he's owning up to a lot of stuff you know he's living a better lifestyle so you know that's that's what you got to do you know everybody wants to sugarcoat shit and 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 please everybody bro you're not if you're not if you're pleasing everybody that means you're living your life like a bitch you yeah. know and i'm not gonna live my life like a bitch so. <laughs> has he come back to jiu-jitsu does he train normally now where is he nah, doing he other was, things? He was thinking about it. He's been going through life struggles, man. Oh, yeah. I bet. I mean, uh, sounds yeah, like I did a, I did a whole thing with uh, this local guy down here in, in Miami. I talked about the whole situation and, like, how he's a, the guy was a compulsive liar. Mm-hmm. You know, um, the guy did a lot of fucked up shit, but he's, he's trying to steer his life back, you know, to a positive way. And I, I forgive a lot of people. And... He came up asking for forgiveness, and I was like, yeah, man, I forgive you. If you need anything, you know, I want to help you live a better life. You know, he messages me all the time asking me, you know, for, like, insight because, you know. That's really cool. About what's happening in his life and, and stuff, and I try to give him the best uh, the best uh, advice that I could give him, you know, because I have my flaws, too. I'm not the best person to ask for advice, but I'll tell you how I feel, and you could take it or, or leave it, you know. Yeah. Same with Tom. Tom That's does cool. the same thing. I I don't usually vent to anybody, and I'll, I'll text Tom. I'll be like, bro, man, I don't know what the fuck's going on with me. Maybe you have an answer. And Tom's like, yeah, man, grab your fucking nuts and be a man. And I'm like, okay. I'm going to grab my nuts and be a man. You know, but he also gives me good life advice, you know, whether it's jiu-jitsu or, or regular day-to-day life, you know. So mm-hmm. it's, it's pretty cool. Everybody needs somebody that they need to talk to. So I try to be that outlet for some of the guys. I think that's really good, man. That's really cool that you're – Keeping that going, being that yeah. positive influence in the world—that's really cool. Yeah, trust me. I, I have I, I say some negative stuff too on Facebook. You know, I'm not perfect. You know, I try to be a positive influence, but eh, I just got to check some people, dude. You know, like yesterday there was a, a big thing about uh, one of my one of my friends who's on the same lineage as me from from the, the Blast team and Henzo team. Uh, Jonathan Calistine. I saw that. You know, I I had I couldn't bite my tongue no more. You know, and I mm. also had to defend one of my homeboys who's on who's on another team. You know, and it. You know, I had to I had to write on there, and I just deleted the threat because it was giving me a headache. You know. Yeah. I got my word out. I called whoever I needed to call out. You know. Yeah. And that was it. But you know, like that was a little negative thing that was happening yesterday. You know, it turned out to a positive. Jonathan got a match in August. Yeah, and I saw. I got to speak up for my boy, cool. you cool. know. So it worked out for a positive, but I had to be a little negative to get that positive, mm-hmm. you know. So I try not to do that too much on Facebook. I don't want to be that Facebook keyboard warrior. Yeah. So. Yeah, man. Yeah. I think that you're doing it the right way, you know, and you're backing up your uh, hard words with also help and advice when the person asks for forgiveness and things like that. So I think hey, that's yep. the way Compassion, to do it, man. You know. You know, tough, hammer, but also nice. And uh, like you said about Tom, you know, like a uh, very strong individual, both mentally and physically, and, you know, a person capable of great violence, but also uh, calm and, you know, in tune with maybe the emotional aspect of things, if that makes sense. And yep. uh, I think that's something that we, we as a society... I guess the, the jujitsu society are kind of figuring out in my opinion, you know, that like you have to be that complete 
like warrior, warrior philosopher in a way, you know, mm-hmm. you, you see that with people like Joe Rogan, you know, Joe Rogan, who's like a bad motherfucker, black belt in jujitsu and stuff like that. But then he and very like manly man type of guy lifts kettlebells all the time, you know, but then he has a very like introspective philosophical side to him. And uh, I think people like him and Tom are showing that like you can be a manly dude, you can be, you know, the most violent dude around capable of beating up anyone but you can also be sensitive yeah 100 percent. you know that's cool so yeah you know tom tom's a good leader and uh mentor like you said to to follow those guidelines by so you know i'll always ask him for advice and stuff and you know he'll give me 100 percent genuine advice you know whether i want to hear it or not he's going to tell me yeah. and that's how we have to be in life is we have to tell people shit that they don't want to hear you know, because that's how you become a better person. But nobody really sees that anymore. You know, yeah. jujitsu, jujitsu is becoming a little bit softer. Hmm. You know, and uh, I think it's cool that it's becoming softer because it's giving more opportunity. But it still has to be firm, and we're losing the validity of the the firmness. And we got to get that back. That's why I think people are making those jiu-jit- make jujitsu violent again. You know, you don't want to be too violent, but you need some violence. How, in, in jiu-jitsu how do compassion. you uh like so when you say jiu-jitsu is becoming a little soft what's an example of that that you would see jiu-jitsu is becoming like i said the sport karate mm. uh you know people are are trying to make it a business out of it which is awesome mm. you know but you don't have to sell yourself out to have a good business from it you know tom's one of those tom has a great great gym with a lot of students you know um, if you look at his classes, there's usually 50 to 100 people on on the mats there. Same with Freddie. Freddie has a very successful gym in Miami. You know, uh, his classes range from anywhere from 30 to 60 people on the mat in a small little location that he has. And you know, they're businessmen, but they also didn't sell their their core values of jujitsu to make an easy buck. You yeah. know, and I see a lot of guys like selling selling themselves out, promoting people too fast just so they could get a belt testing fee. Yeah. Uh, no you points. know, doing these never get leg locked again, you know, <laughs> type type classes or something, you know, yeah, and everybody's considering themselves to be an expert. You know, I've seen so many fucking leg lock experts on social media. It's pathetic, you know, and and I love leg locks, don't get me wrong. I've been doing leg locks before they were cool, but I don't consider myself no expert. You know, Sean Applegate, great leg locker, doesn't consider himself an expert. Uh, John, Jonathan Kalistein doesn't consider himself an expert. Even Eddie Cummings is the most humble guy, and I think he's the best leg locker in the world. Yeah, He doesn't yeah. even consider himself that much of an expert. You know, he's always learning new ways to break a foot, you know, and same here. Josh Hayden, leg lock expert, doesn't consider himself a leg lock expert. Mm-hmm. Jason Hayden, you know. These are all good quality, top-notch guys that have beat quality leg lockers, and you know everybody now is is a leg lock expert. You know, you know you, you have one good heel hook. You know that's that's one thing that my uh, I train with Neil Malayson, who's a catch wrestler, mm-hmm. um, really great guy. They call him the ground marshal. Very good leg locker too. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was like, bro, there's so many douchebags out here that have one good heel hook. And they're a fucking leg lock expert. He goes, to me, if you're going to be a leg lock expert, you got to chain your leg locks how you do an arm bar to triangle. Yes. You know? Yes. That's when you're considered even thinking about being an expert, you know? No. He's like, you just can't have a good heel hook. You have to have a good straight foot lock, a good knee bar, a good toe hold. You know, all the extremities of a leg, that considers you a leg lock expert. Yeah. And there's some guys that have like a good uh, ankle lock and they're like, oh, I'm a leg lock expert. No, bro. You just have a good ankle lock. That's not how it works. <laughs> That's not how it works. No. You know? Like, Josh Josh Hayden, bro. That dude, he would toe hold me, knee bar me, straight foot lock me, heel hook me, bend my leg this way, I tap. You know, crazy shit. He's a leg lock expert. Neil. Neil fucks me up with, like, these weird-ass leg locks that I've never even seen. Like, yeah. twisting, grabbing my foot and twisting around behind my ass, and I got to tap. You know, and then knee barring me right after. You know, leg lock expert. Yeah. Jason Hayden. Heel hook me, uh, straight foot lock me. Leg lock expert. Sean Applegate, heel hook me, toe hold me, knee barred me. 
and, and I'm a leg lock guy, and I'm getting tapped by leg locks from these guys. Yeah. So they're good, you know. That's you have some of these guys. You have some of these guys that that they throw little videos on, you know, and they hit one good leg lock on a guy that has no experience with leg locks in a tournament, and they're all of a sudden a leg lock expert. You know, it's like, bro, get the fuck out of here. Fight a fight a good leg lock guy. Prove yourself. Mm-hmm. Then you could be considered a part of the like dudes that do leg locks. You know, I don't know, bro. It's, it's just. <laughs> Social media, you could, you know, you could yeah. be the most credited of non-accredited people and get so much business. Yeah, I know. You know? Um, like, there's guys talking on on jujitsu on how to be a world champion. They and they, they never even competed in the worlds or anything like that, or or won a world's medal or anything. So how are you gonna tell me that I could that I what I need to be a world champion when you've never been a world champion? You know, yeah. that's like me telling you, hey. I'm gonna make you into an ADCC champion. You've never you know, been. You know, I'm gonna give you the tools to become an ADCC. Bro, I haven't even won the trials yet. You yeah. know, like get out of here with that bullshit. You know, and, and that's what I'm seeing a lot. Is like these guys are giving these whole motivational quotes. All everybody. Another thing too is that nobody's original nowadays in jujitsu. Everybody's just trying to bite off each other. You know, like I see a bunch of black belts trying to act like Tom posting live videos. You know, doing this. Me, I post my live videos just so I could talk my shit and make people laugh. <laughs> And let you guys know what I'm thinking, you know. And I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, you know. Yeah. Tom talks about like philosophical shit, you know, and all that. I, I might dabble in that, but dude, I just want to talk my shit and let you guys laugh and hear about it, you know. I'm not trying to be no role model out here. Yeah. You know? Tom's, the role model is Tom. Yeah. I'm just I'm just like a little hobbit, just trying to <laughs> trying to sneak in and give my little my little Ruben tip of the day, you know. But then you have some of these black boys they're getting on live video and they're like. Oh, do this, do that, do this. Yeah, but dude, you're telling me to do shit that you don't even do. You're a hypocrite. Yeah, you know. You see that? I see that a lot. Not just in jujitsu, you just fucking everybody. Bro, everybody, everywhere. Like, like it's it's just crazy, bro. Everybody's trying to emulate somebody. You you got some jujitsu guys that are trying to be Tony Robbins. You got some jujitsu guys trying to be Tom the Blast. You got, I don't know. Next thing you know, black belts and stuff are gonna start mumble rapping. You know. <laughs> Now, you know, maybe we'll get a really legit black belt mumble rapper, something like that. But Yeah, maybe. <laughs> probably not too many of them. Probably not too many of them, dude. Um, yeah, I think that's a great perspective, for sure. And I see it a lot, too. I mean, I'm not as experienced as you. I don't have a lot of the insight that you have, but I see it. You know, like, it's... Uh, it becomes obvious and you see i like uh tom talks a lot about um like you're not a good leg locker unless you can leg lock someone who is also good at leg locks and not get leg locked yourself and that's that's the criteria to be not even an expert just to be good at leg locks and uh uh my instructor i would consider my instructor um here in germany a leg lock expert but he yeah he's the same he would not say that he is a fucking leg lock expert you know he's he's very humble but he and he tells us all the time he tells us like you are not a good leg locker unless you can leg lock people who are also good at leg locks and not get leg locked yourself dude it's it's crazy i've yeah. seen these so-called leg lock experts and all they lose by is leg lock yeah it doesn't it's that's not how it works <laughs> like it's a two-way thing it's like if you're good at leg locks you also have to be good at defending the leg lock that's half the battle you know, I've been caught in leg locks in tournaments, but like I could count them on my hand. You know, it's not too many times I've been caught by leg locks, and it's by other guys that that are really like, good at leg locks. Yeah. You know, so hey, it's just it's it's crazy like how social media now you could you could be a really good motivational speaker slash want to be competitor or the Facebook competitor and give advice, and people are actually going to take this shit and listen to it. Yeah, and they're gonna they're gonna try to emulate it. It's it's Yep, they're gonna share like, it around everywhere. Fucking, you like, know. have you seen that picture where the shit's going in one dude's mouth and he's shitting that shit that's going in his mouth into somebody else's mouth? That's, no, that's but I can I imagine it. <laughs> that's what I see, bro. It's like you're eating shit and then you're shitting it into somebody else's mouth. Yeah, dude. You know, and um, I mean, a lot of it is just ignorance, um, and it comes from a lack of experience, which is understandable because you know the sport is growing, which is great. Yeah. We have a lot of white belts and blue belts, 
which is great. That's that's the thing is the white belts. You know, yeah. you're you're fresh. You don't know what the fuck's going on. No. You know, it's like you saw a woman naked for the first time. You're yeah. excited. You can't wait to have more of it. Yeah. So you go to every <laughs> little thing and you start seeing everything and you're freaking out. You're freaking the fuck out and just looking at it and being like, oh my god, oh my god. And you don't know who's legit and who's fake because you're so brand new. Yeah. That when you get experienced, now you're like, ah, oh, that guy, <laughs> that guy is fucking stupid. Yeah. Oh, that guy, that guy's legit. You know. Yeah. It's it's nuts, dude. Yeah, um, I had we had a uh, Dean on the podcast. Dean Lister was on the podcast a little while ago. Hopefully, he's coming back because we're he's coming to do a seminar next month. But I asked him, um, like, how do you tell? You know, what is your criteria for like how do you tell? Because there's so many leg lock experts in quotation marks these days. It's like how do you tell? And he said, you know, for leg locks especially, but for anything, anyone who claims to be an expert, you have to look at their uh, record their competition record he's like have they leg lock people in high level tournaments have the are those people good leg lockers like you need to do your research you can't just say oh he's got a dvd saying he's a leg lock expert you know you have to do your research and say does this guy have a record of hitting this in co- in high level tournaments against good leg lockers you know or whatever yeah. you know i agree I yeah that. you have like I, I, I'm reiterating it so many times. Like you have these. I, I posted a status. I'm like, bro, it's easy to hit fancy foot locks and leg lock somebody if they don't know nothing about leg locks. Yeah. You know exactly. it, it, it. You know you know I could have like highlight M and R rules if I go against like a blue belt. For you sure. Know? Yeah. Someone who's never seen that. No. <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. Like I go to some gyms. Um, cause I love the M and R role. I still suck at it because, <laughs> you know, I'm not. That good. You might suck at it, but you could do it on a white belt, and you'll oh look my God, fucking I look, like a champ. It's the coolest you know? thing and they've ever me, seen. You know, you can't tell what belt somebody is. No. You know, yeah, it, it's it's ridiculous. You know, it's it's ridiculous. It looks cool on, on video. Yeah, look at this fancy leg lock. But is it against a formidable opponent? Hmm. Not really. Yeah, man, this has been a really great chat. I've unfortunately I've got to wrap this up. But yeah, no worries, um, man. before we end this, is there uh, is there anything you'd like to promote or talk about or any upcoming stuff you're doing? Um, just uh, I'll give a couple of shout outs to my sponsors and uh, and my team. Um, yeah, no judges needed. It's a, a clothing brand that I've been a part of for a few years now. You know, a very great company. If mm-hmm. if you guys use my code Ruben BJJ, you get fifteen percent off. Uh, no judges needed gear. Um, my strength and conditioning coaches at Fast Twitch are amazing. Uh, uh, the BJJ box is an awesome thing too. It, they send you like T-shirts, soaps, and all that cool oh, stuff that's cool. jujitsu related, so you don't get no ringworm on your ass. Yeah, you know, um, it's a very good company, you know, and it's ran by awesome people. So they're a great sponsor. Um, yeah, the gyms I train at: WMB, Freddie Trillo, and uh, Henzo Gracie Weston, and of course my instructor, uh, Tom the Blast. I can't thank him enough. So. Yeah, that's about it, you know. I'm Thanks, just uh, thankful for everybody that keeps on my social media and supports me. And guys like you that have podcasts and invite me on, you know, hey, it's man. a great honor. Thanks for coming on it's the show. Day. It's an honor for me. And yeah, uh, man. Hey, man, let's do this again soon, and hopefully we get to meet in person sometime. Yeah, for sure, bro. If you ever want to come down to Miami, you got spots to train at, man. You can Thanks, train with dude. me. Yeah, maybe I'll pop along with Andreas if he goes back. <laughs> Andreas was saying he wasn't gonna leave. <laughs> he was he was texting me. <laughs> I gotta tell this uh, for people who like are like who who's Andreas? Andreas is the my business partner with Matrix. Like I handle the podcast and he does all the the videos. So we're podcast and video company. And uh, he went to Miami. That's how we connected with you. And uh, Andreas was like, "Dude, I don't think I'm gonna come back. I might just stay here. The weather's so nice." And I thought he was I thought he was joking. But I talked to our instructor who's known Andreas much longer than me, and he was like, "No, dude, one time Andreas went on a one week trip to France, and he was like, "You know i'm I'm good." And then he just stayed there for a year. <laughs> and he was like, "So Andreas might not come back, but uh, but he decided to come back, which I'm happy because uh, yeah, andreas is a is a cool guy. I love training with him. Yeah, he's and, great. Uh, yeah, it was awesome having him around. Like he would always ask me questions and stuff. He's a, he's a good dude, you know. So when he asked me to show a technique for you guys, I was like, yeah, no worries. And I showed, ironically, an Eminari rule. Dude, know, I've been trying to go for it lately, way. and it's it's great. Thanks a lot for showing it. I'll post it. Um, anyone who's listening, everything we talked about and all these videos, they're gonna be in the show notes on our website. 
So, um, Ruben, thanks a lot for being on the show and I uh, hope to talk to you again soon. Thanks to Ruben for coming on the show and thanks everyone for tuning in. We have new episodes every Monday. Next Monday, we're going to be joined by Christopher O'Dell, the owner of Datsusara. Datsusara is a company that produces jujitsu apparel made exclusively from hemp. Chris is going to drop a lot of knowledge about hemp and how that can be better used to create excellent jujitsu products. Tune in next Monday to hear that episode. Next weekend, make sure you tune in for the Matrix Jiu-Jitsu Invitational Tournament. We'll be covering that tournament with a live stream. The stream will be free and it's going to be available on our YouTube page. Additionally, a few days afterwards, we're going to be posting H HD, HD videos of the every fight that happened during the tournament. This is going to be a five-man round-robin submission-only tournament, no gi, leg lock frenzy, hashtag Jiu-Jitsu Carnage. The athletes will be fighting for a 400 euro cash prize six month free account to yoga for bjj and a support package from bjj fight gear thanks also to inverted gear the grindstone grappling company musoo gear and matrix jiu-jitsu for helping us put on this event we have some really cool events coming up March 25th and 26th, we'll be hosting Leg Lock Weekend, also at Matrix Jiu-Jitsu in Kaiserslautern, Germany. On the 25th of March, Olivier Taza from the Dana Her Death Squad and TriStar will be joining us to teach a seminar. The very next day, Dean Lister is making his return, hopefully to the podcast and definitely to the, to the academy. Dean is awesome. He's a great instructor. If you've never taken a seminar with him, I highly recommend you do so. He's awesome. Additionally, on the 8th of April, Ethan Krellenston, also from the Danahar Death Squad and TriStar, will be teaching a seminar at Matrix. For more information, check out our social media pages. If you guys want to give us uh, some support, go to iTunes or Stitcher or and Stitcher. You know, if you want to do both, that, that'd be great too. Please give us a five-star rating and a review. It's a great way to support the show. It helps us rank higher on iTunes or Stitcher search results and lets more people find out about the show. Additionally, if you're thinking of other ways to support us, give us a like, a share, uh, maybe show this podcast to someone who you think would enjoy it, things like that. Anything you can do, no matter how small, support. <laughs> no matter how small your contribution, whether it be a share, a like, a comment, a personal message, an IM, a MySpace comment, whatever you can think of, it helps. Since starting this podcast and also the YouTube channel, I've learned so many little things about how to support YouTubers or podcasters. There's so many ways you can do it that you wouldn't even think of. For example, if you have a YouTuber who you really like and you want to help them out, watch the entirety of their YouTube video because YouTube tracks how long people are watching each video for and then that helps them decide how uh, where to rank the YouTube video in their search results. So if you are have a YouTube channel or you have a friend who has a YouTube channel and you want to you wanna grow the channel, make sure that you watch every video to the end because if you're just like, like let's say you're trying to help your friend gets, and you're trying to get him some views and you don't watch the whole video, then you're actually hurting him. You're hurting his search results. I thought that was interesting. On that note, if you're ever looking to produce a podcast or create a YouTube channel yourself and you want to hear from me, feel free to reach out and we can talk and I'll share everything I know. Thanks as always for listening. Make sure you tune in next week for Christopher Odell. As always, thanks to my friends at Waves Overhead. Waves Overhead is a band from my home state of Maryland and they do the theme music for this very podcast. Their song, To Make Amends, is the official theme song of the Matrix podcast. You heard a little bit of the show at the very beginning and I'm gonna play the rest for you in just a moment. If you wanna support Waves Overhead, go to wavesoverhead.bandcamp.com. You can download their music there for free or you can give them a donation and help them out a little bit financially. Give it up for Waves Overhead.